All right, so we started off reading here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, but we're actually going to be, keep a finger here, keep your place there. We're going to be coming back to this passage a little bit later. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 4. Now, what I'm going to be preaching on tonight is biblical division or separation among churches, among people, among Christians. And before I get into the division, I want to talk about unity and unity being a good thing, how we want to have unity within our church. We want to have a, a one faith here at, at Word of Truth Baptist Church. We all ought to be in agreement on, especially on major doctrines and, uh, and, our, and our purpose, our cause, what the fight is, you know, what we're doing to get into the fight, doing the soul winning, doing everything, and having that unity. Unity is a great thing. In Psalm 133, 1, the Bible says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Church is a place that we come to where you could get supported by and edified by other people within the church. We're here for each other. This is a church family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're supposed to be looking out for one another, encouraging one another, loving one another. And it is very pleasant and very good when the brethren within a local church dwell together in unity, when we can all be unified, when we all have the same purpose. That's great. The last thing you want to see at church is a lot of infighting and, and various sects or groups that are, that are, you know, talk bad about each other or don't like each other. And you have, you have all kinds of, um, you know, bitterness and striving within the church. That is not a good setting to be in. It, it would be best if, if the whole church, for the brethren can dwell together in unity. That is a goal. and That's a very good goal. Ephesians chapter four, look at verse number one. The Bible reads, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's something that we need to work at. It's something that we need to make sure that we're trying our best, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, and that's a Holy Spirit that we're trying to keep here, in the bond of of peace, keeping things peaceful, keeping things friendly, keeping things unified within the church. And in order to do that, we need all lowliness. We need meekness. We, meet, we need humility as to not be lifted up with pride because that's one of the number one causes for there to be strives between people. When there's fightings between people within church or anywhere for that matter, Oftentimes, somebody is offended. Somebody has been done wrong to someone else, or it's just perceived, and, and people get so lifted up in themselves and in their pride that they make a big issue out of nothing more often than not. And if they could just swallow their pride, if they could just have some humility, have some lowliness, and have some long-suffering, as it says here, then you can put up with a lot more and you can keep the peace. One way to avoid a fight, oftentimes, and this is one of the reasons why I think you see it's a lot more likely that you're going to see two men fighting than two women fighting, at least when it comes to like, you know, a fist fight or something like that. I'm not saying women don't fight. Of course they do. But it's a lot more likely to see that happen in between two guys when it's, you know, oh, you, you know, you're walking down the street and someone bumps shoulders or something. And you're like, oh, you're disrespecting me. Oh, you, you can't do that to me. And it's just this big, lifted up, proud attitude oh, someone stepped on your toe or someone bumped into you. Yeah, because that, that, that's a big reason to go and then try to smash their face in, right? That's the Christian thing to do. Of course not. We need to have humility. We need to forbear one another in love and have long suffering and be able to put up with things. And when someone does you wrong or says something rude or says something that you don't like, in order to keep that unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and to work together with one another and to love one another, we need to have forgiveness. We need to forbear. We need to be humble and always keep that in the forefront of our mind within church that we're, that we're and, and even with other people, obviously, but to keep that unity of the spirit within the church 
we need to have these attributes, meekness, long sorry, forbearing one another. Jump down to verse number 11. Elizabeth, stop doing that and pay attention. Verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. These are various um, gifts that God has bestowed upon people to fulfill different roles. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And they all varying roles. Verse number 12 explains why. And this is why church is so important, by the way. And for people that might be listening on the internet or for people who only come to church every once in a while and aren't coming to all the services and aren't making it a priority, look, God has given you people that you can learn from, people that are going to be teachers and pastors and evangelists and, and prophets. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. This church is involved in a work. We are a ministry. We are ministering to other people. There is a work that we are trying to get done here and we need to help other people. And the, and the people listed here, God has given for the perfecting of the saints. And if you're, if you're in church, if you're a believer, not if you're in church, but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are sanctified. You are a saint. And one of the things that church provides for you and teachers provide for you is perfecting of you and, the, and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So again, we see a reference to having unity, having good unity in the faith among the church. And one of the ways we're going to have unity is by attending a church where you have pastors, you have teachers, you have prophets that are teaching the word of God, that have studied the word of God, that know the word of God, that God is using them to help keep everybody in this group unified together in the same doctrines and in the same belief with one another so that we can get the work done, that we can do the ministering work that needs to be done here and we could all have the same goal and the same objective and we could all get along. I am making sure that I'm spending enough time on, you know, that you understand this is the importance of having unity. We need to be unified within the church. The problem comes in is when people try to apply this, this concept of unity and apply it too broadly to encompass lots of different groups that might just call themselves Christian. And that's what's known as the ecumenical movement. Ecumenical means that, that you're just basically joining forces with all different types of, of various you know, Christian groups, organiza organizations, churches, what have you. And the problem with that is in order to unify more, you become unified on less things because you have to give up doctrines. You have to give up this. You have to give up that in order to, to all come together and just be in agreement on something. I mean, at the end of the day, if you, if you don't draw the line anywhere, you could just say, well, let's just unify with everybody that claims to believe in God. Doesn't matter of their religion. And let's just join forces and yoke up with these people and team up just for God in general. And I'm going to show you why that is not true and it's not something that we ought to be striving for. The unity that we need is within the church. It's within the body, the body of Christ. That's why the Bible says here, he gave some apostles, prophets, teachers in Ephesians 4, for the perfecting of the saint, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, when we read that edifying of the body of Christ, this isn't talking about some universal church. We do not believe in the universal church here, which, by the way, in case you didn't know, the word Catholic means literally universal. So when you hear the Catholic church, that all that means is the universal church. We do not believe in the Catholic church. We do not believe in this universal church. Some people hold to the doctrine that once a person gets saved, they are part of this greater entity that's called the church. 
We don't believe that. We believe in church is. We believe that, yes, God has established the church as an organization. But when we refer to the church singular, it's just referring to any particular church that is a congregation. We see, first of all, it only makes sense in Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 4 when it says that all of those uh, people were given, you know, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, because they're edifying the body of Christ wherever they're at. There's multiple pastors, there's multiple churches, or most multiple bodies of Christ. Christ is the head of all of them. But I'm going to show you here um, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 12, we're going to get our definition of what a church even is. Hebrews 2.12 says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And what that is, that's a quote from the book of Psalms, and it's a quote from Psalm 22.22, Notice the distinction here. It says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So in the Old Testament, it uses the word, it says, in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. In the New Testament, it's quoted. It's quoting scripture as saying, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So a church is literally a congregation as defined by the Bible itself. That's what a church is. So, um, when people congregate together, that's what's known as a church. That's why we, don't, we call this the church building that we meet in because the building itself is not a church. Now, oftentimes, you know, in today's vernacular, people talk about things, oh, do you see this church and that church and that church? And they're referring to a church building. And that's technically incorrect because it literally is just a building. That is not the church. But, it, I mean, it's, it's part of our common speech. People use it. But we just need to understand when we read the Bible that it's not just referring to some building. It's referring to a body of believers. It's referring to a group, a congregation specifically. Not just a group in, gener in general, but a group that meets together, that congregates together. When people congregate, they assemble. It's an assembly, a congregation of people that come together. Now, in order for there to be some universal church, well, church by definition is an assembly. And the reason why there's not a universal church is because not everybody has ever congregated together at one time. And think about this. If there, was a, if there is a universal church, when you read these, these uh, verses, like, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Well, you could sing praise unto God anywhere then if, if just every believer is part of this church, is part of a church or the universal church, then you'd always be in the midst of the church, right? Because every, you know, every, every believer is part of that body, so it really wouldn't matter where you sing. No, he's, he's specifically pointing out a place of singing praise unto the Lord in the midst of the congregation, in the midst of the church, being in church, singing praises unto God. I just want to make sure that's clear because Pretty much, I think everyone, and I don't, I don't know, I mean, I don't know enough about every single various group that's out there, but the vast majority of people who believe um, in this, in the, that are part of this ecumenical movement that just want to join hands with every single person that calls themselves Christian will believe in this concept of a universal church. And see, so we don't believe that. Um, and a lot of people have a problem, and they'll, they even ask, they don't understand, well, why are there so many different denominations? Why are there so many Christian denominations? Doesn't God want there only to be one? Yeah, God does want there only to be one, but the problem is, is that people don't all agree on what the Bible says. And what the Bible says is very important, various doctrines and things like that. You know, I mean, you, you can't... God would like it if everybody had perfect faith, perfect knowledge, understood everything and could unify together. That would be great. But it's not reality. And there's a lot of people that aren't even saved that go to churches as well. And those, you know, obviously, um, if you don't have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to guide you into all truth and wisdom, then you're going to come up with all kinds of false doctrines. Unbelievers do not understand God's Word and henceforth will come forth, come forward with various strange doctrines. But, um, we also want to make sure we don't sacrifice truth or doctrine just for the sake of having unity, right? So when it comes to biblical 
positions and, and standpoints as a church, as an assembly of people, we decide what it is that we believe about this. And, you know, obviously, you know, some things are more important than others. But we need to stand for what's right. We need to stand for the Word of God, especially on the important things. And I'll just say this, if people have salvation wrong, then we can't have unity. There's no way you could have unity with people who don't even believe the same thing about salvation. And that's why we are separate from the, every other church just about, I mean, not every other church, but um, the vast majority of denominations out there, churches out there, don't even have salvation right. And we're not going to just yoke up with every other church that claims the name of Jesus. Other organizations do that. We were just recently involved with one. I will get to that a little bit later. But they let people come in from all different, all different backgrounds, all different plans of salvation, people who believe you could lose your salvation. And they, th they figure all of that stuff is just secondary. All they want to do is just bring everyone together just in the name of Jesus and... and think that they're doing good by allowing all these groups to come together. And here's the problem is that when you're not willing to make a stand on the important issues, then you basically stand for nothing. Yeah, you have to make a stand on things. Amos 3.3, 3, go back if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where we started off. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? If we're going to have unity, we need to agree on things. If we're going to walk together or work together or do anything together, I'm going to yoke up with anybody to get some work done, we need to be in, in some level of agreement. We have to be agreed on the work that we're doing. We have to be agreed to a specific point. Where we started off reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 14. The Bible specifically tells us, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We are told, we are taught by God's word not to be yoking ourselves together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness. When we are, are getting prepared to do some ministering work or to, or to do some, you know, some other work that we believe that God wants us to do as a church, go out soul winning or anything like that, we are not going to be yoking up with other churches that don't have the right doctrine on salvation because they're unbelievers. It, they can claim the name of Christ all they want, but if they're an unbeliever, we are not going to yoke up together with them to do some work for the Lord. The Bible says not to do that. What concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, wherefore, which means for this reason, come out from among them and be ye separate. saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We are to be separate. We are to be come out from among them, come out from unbelievers, come out from idolaters, not to yoke up with these people. That's why we're not going to yoke up with the Catholic Church. They're a bunch of idolaters. We're going to be separate from them. We're going to be separate from the Church of Christ. We're going to be separate from the Assemblies of God. We're going to be separate from the Nazarenes. We're going to be separate from the Pentecostal churches. We're going to be separate from the Mormons, separate from the Jehovah's Witnesses. We're going to be separate from all these people that don't even have salvation right, that don't believe in salvation by grace through faith alone, that don't believe in the eternal security of the believer. We have to make a stand on these important doctrines and not just forsake them just for the sake of unity, just for the sake of feeling good about coming together and adding more people to our group. We're not going to do it. We need, we need to make a stand on something. G turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and this is another reason why it's important to be reading your Bibles on your own because the common concept that people have about Christianity is just saying, oh, everyone needs to be unified. We need to join together. We need to join forces with all these other people. But that's not what Jesus even said he came to do. 
We already saw the importance of being unified within the church. That is important. Unified within the local assembly, the local congregation of people that can join together, that can edify one another and have the same goal and have the same purpose because we believe the same things. Because we're unified. That is important. But we don't need to just extend this out to just a whole bunch of other people that don't believe the same way we do. There's no way we could be unified. Jesus Christ himself said in Luke chapter 12, verse number 51, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided. Three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Out of Jesus Christ's own mouth, he says, I came to bring division. It's going to happen. Now, why? Do you think it's just, it's, it's Jesus' will that he wants everybody to be divided? Not necessarily, but here's what he does want. He wants those that believe in God's word to stand on God's word and not to compromise God's word just in order to have unity. And he even brings up examples within a family. Now, if there's ever a situation where you think you ought to have unity, it would be within your family, right? Because having a strong family is really important and keeping a strong bond and commitment to your mother, to your father, to your brother, to your sister. We teach that to our children. I think it's extremely important to have a strong family, but here's the difference. We cannot put even the unity within our family above God, above Jesus Christ. And see, when people are believers within a household, and then other people are unbelievers. We ought to try to live peaceably. But at that moment, you are at odds in your belief. And we need to maintain our fidelity to Jesus Christ and our faithfulness to him to not compromise our faith to Jesus Christ in order to keep unity at home among family members. Right? And, and unfortunately, this does happen. But Jesus says, hey, it's going to divide people because we all have a free will. And he wants those that believe to remain firm in their belief to Christ. Now, there's, there's you know, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There are certain things that we exhibit long suffering with, you know, especially at home, maybe with unbelievers in general, that we can suffer with some things, we can put up with some things, but we can never back down on our personal faith and convictions and beliefs about the Bible. We can't do that. God doesn't want us to compromise his word. If we can live peaceably while standing firm on God's word, that's what he wants us to do. We're not out to cause fights. We're not out trying to just make this division happen but we do have to stay true to our beliefs in God's word. And as a result, other people might not be able to take that and it's going to divide people and it's going to cause problems and it's going to cause fights, especially in households where maybe the whole family grew up a certain faith, whether it be Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or whatever it may be. They, they all grew up a certain way and believe a certain way. And then one of those people gets saved and starts going to a different church and starts talking about their faith and talking about, hey, it's faith only. Look, you got to understand this, you know, and starts to, to, to shine the light of the gospel that God has given to them. And other people, even close family members, might not like that very much at all as they, in, in love, try to explain how their family members could be saved because they love them. And if you love your family members, you ought to try to get them saved. You can't just let them go to hell. We need to bring it up. And you know what? That might bring division. But it's worth it. It may be sad. It may not be easy. But it's the right thing to do. You don't really love that person if you let them go to hell. I, I covered that pretty a lot this morning. We need to be preaching the gospel to our families, even if that means they might separate from us. But see, this is what happens 
when you actually believe the word of God, that you make stand a stand on God's word and you're firm and unmovable, people will separate and divide. It's going to happen. And we cannot sacrifice that faith in God's word just to be unified with more people. That's not what Jesus would, would have us to do. The truth divides because when you know truth from God's word, things are either right or wrong. It, it, it becomes very simple once you understand what the Bible teaches. Fornication, it's either right or wrong. And I'll tell you what, the Bible says it's wrong. Adultery, it's either right or wrong. The Bible says it's wrong. And you start to realize more and more things. Hey, God said this is wrong. God said this is wrong. God says this is wrong. We need to be able to make a stand and say, yes, this is what the Bible says. This is right and this is wrong because God said so. I didn't make it up. He said it. But the truth divides. The truth is going to separate right from wrong. And if we can stay true to God's word, in the end, it will end up dividing people from other people. And that's why I also said, you know, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. They're not going to be in agreement with you on this. And this is really important that we obey God. We need to be willing to take a stand on the word of God and not worry about what other people are going to think. That is probably the, the biggest problem that people have is just being concerned or worried about how other people might view you or, or look at you or, or if you're going to lose a friendship or a family member or just break contact with you. But when God tells us through his words to preach his word and to tell other people and to warn other people, he also tells us to not worry about what other people think. I'm going to read for you from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah and Ezekiel are both two prophets that God used. Two ordinary men that God used as prophets. And their message was not a popular one. It was not a pleasant one. Both of them preached hard sermons or hard teachings, hard truths basically telling the nation of Israel that they were wrong, telling God's people that they were in sin, that they had to repent, that they had to get right with God. And this was God's instruction to both of those prophets. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So God says, I'm going to tell you exactly what to say, what my commandment is. You go and speak that. Verse 8 says, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. He already knows they're going to give him nasty looks. He already knows they're not going to like what he has to say. And he warns your mind. He says, Hey, don't be afraid of them. Don't let them scare you. You just do and say what I tell you to do. And this is what God would like from us. He wants our obedience. He wants us to offer up ourselves willingly to be able to preach the truth, preach the truth in love, but we got to do it what, the way that God says and, and what he says. We can't change God's word. We need to just, just deliver the message the way it's said by God. We're the messenger. And you could take a little bit of comfort in that too. You're not just coming up with your own opinion. See, when, when you're giving people the gospel or any, any Bible truth for that matter, you don't have to get offended when they don't believe you because it's not your own thoughts that you're coming up with anyways. You don't have to worry when they, if they reject you. You don't have to worry if they get angry with you because it's not you, it's God's word that they have the problem with. Ezekiel chapter 2, he gave similar instructions to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 3, the Bible says, And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. So he's saying, he's prefacing it right away saying, This is not an easy crowd. This is not a group of people that, that is going to take what you have to say uh, very well. And you know what? I can take a little bit of sympathy for Ezekiel here because we live in an area where a lot of people aren't very receptive to hearing the gospel. So many people are, but there's many that are not. 
and they have stiff hearts and they're rebellious towards God and they don't want to hear it. But God didn't, God didn't say, well, they're not going to want to hear it, so just forget about it altogether. God says, no, just go to them and say, thus saith the Lord. And that's our job. We don't judge who's going to listen and who's not going to listen. We go to them and say, thus saith the Lord. This is what God said. This is what the Bible says. And then we quote the Bible to them. We read it to them. We don't change it. We just say what it says. And here's what Ezekiel did. And this is what God said to Ezekiel. Verse 5, And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, say, whether they listen to you or not, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And again, he brings up the, the looks on their faces and the words that they may use because they're going to try to scare you and intimidate you and get you to stop talking the word of the Lord. But he says, you need to just stay strong. You need to do what I say to do. Verse 7 says, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. He's saying, don't be like them. You obey me. You do what I tell you to do. They're not listening to me. They're not obeying me. You go, you tell them what I tell you to tell them. And whether they listen or not, that's not, that's not up to you. When we go out and preach the gospel, it's not up to us whether a person is going to believe that or not. That's on them. But it's still our job to go and preach the gospel. It's still our job to teach the truth. It's still our job to tell people what the Bible says and to inform them and to warn them and to show them the love of God. We need to show them these things. It is our job, but we can't be concerned about how anyone else is going to respond. We just have to stand up for what's right and, and, and preach the truth and let the chips fall where they may. Whatever happens, happens, as long as we are not rebellious towards God and just saying, okay, God, you've told me to do this. You've told me to preach your word. You've told me to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, so I'm just going to do it. Not going to worry about what anyone does or, th or thinks or says or the, the faces that they make. And you'd be surprised. You know, it sounds kind of funny, oh, the, you know, being worried about the faces that they make. When you start preaching in front of people, You'll understand what, I, what, you're, what I'm talking about and what this verse is talking about. People make some pretty bad faces, especially during some, some hard sermons. Some sermons that people don't like to hear out of the Bible. Some things that, that, that God's Word says that might strike someone in their heart because they're guilty of a sin and they don't want to acknowledge it. You get some pretty nasty looks sometimes. And, you know, I say as a preacher, because I get to see more faces in general, I see, I see more people come and go, and, 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 and I see have a lot more interaction in that, in that regard. But you may face this, too, even in your personal life. I mean, Jesus said that there's going to be, you know, father and, and son and mother and daughter, and, you know, these people are going to be divided because of their faith. And that's, that's ultimately why. Jesus came, because, and he wants you to be committed to him. Jesus said, if you love father or mother or son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. That's what he said. Jesus needs to be first in our life. He's priority number one. And look, family is very important. They're number two, but Jesus is number one. We need to maintain that fidelity to him at all costs, at all costs. Whether it be our life or our relationships, Jesus remains number one. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verse number 11 of Matthew 5. This is at the very end of the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed, you know, all the different blessings. It's called the Beatitudes. Well, verse number 11, it says, blessed are ye... When men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said, that's a blessing. 
You may not feel like it's a blessing right away when people are, are saying nasty things about you or lying about you and, you know, persecuting you. But he says, you know what? When people do that to you, you're blessed. You're blessed by God because God sees all the wrong things that happen and he'll make them right. And when you can suffer and take it patiently, and what he says, for my sake, not because of something that you did, right? Not because you screwed up and you caused problems with people, but because you are preaching Jesus, because you are doing what's right. For Jesus' sake, you suffer persecutions, you suffer wrongfully, and you take it. He says, I see that, and I'll bless you for it. God will take care of you. We just need to have the faith to do what God said, because God said be long-suffering. God said be merciful. God said to say the things that we're supposed to say. God told us to preach his word. And we do that. And when these things happen, he says, not only should you not feel bad about it, you should actually be happy about it. In the next verse, verse 12, it says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. That's the opposite response you might think to do, but we can be very happy because he says, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Every major prophet that came from God suffered persecution. They suffered for the cause of Christ. And if we're going to do a great cause or a great work or ministering for the Lord, we need to be able to expect that and actually count it joy. Because if we are truly walking by faith and, and seeing things that we can't see physically with our eyes and understanding that God has rewards for us in heaven, even if we don't know exactly what they are, we see how much God has told us the rewards are going to be very good. We could understand and say, hey, when this happens, we could actually be happy instead of being sad because we know that God's word is true and he's not going to withhold from us. And if he says we're going to be rewarded, what kind, I mean, who would you rather have reward you, some human on earth or God in heaven? If someone says, I'm going to give you a reward, right? I would, I'll, any day of the week, I'll take God's reward over anything that man can give me because God's reward is going to be the best anyway. So we can, we can take that and use that as comfort. So when we suffer persecution, when, when people are lying about us or slandering us, praise God. We'll take it. I want, I want to thank those people sometimes for persecuting me because thank you, you just earned me some more rewards in heaven from my God. And if we have that attitude, you know what? Our life will just be that much more full of joy anyways. God wants us to have joy. He says we're going to be persecuted. He says we're going to go through hard times, but we can still go through hard times and have joy. And the perfect example of this is the disciples. You read through the book of Acts and it always amazes me when you see them they're beaten. They're thrown in prison. And then when it's all over, they come out and it says they were leaping for joy and rejoicing because they, God counted them worthy to suffer for his name. And, and that, was, that was, you know, they, they were ecstatic about it. They were happy about it. And we need to get to the place where we could be happy about those things too. If they were able to do it, there's no reason why we can't. And it's a, good, it's a proper outlook to have on this life and on the problems that, that people suffer in this life is to be able to, you know, as long as we're keeping ourselves right, you know, as long as we're doing good and we're not suffering because of things that we've done to ourselves, right? This is when we suffer for Jesus' sake. Verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Again, another verse that if people were reading their Bibles regularly, they would know. God didn't, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to provide the, the payment for the, the punishment according to the law for our sins. He came to fulfill the law, but the law is not completely destroyed. You see, the Bible says, defines sin as transgression of God's law. If the law were destroyed, there would be no sin. 
because there'd be no law to say that that's wrong. The law is still in place in the sense that we're still sinners. But when we have Jesus' blood to cleanse us from our sin, we are no longer bound by the curse of the law. We're free from that curse. But we, the, the law still exists, and we ought to be mindful of that and, and obey the law. But thank God that he saved us from that curse so that we don't have to worry about ever being damned to hell because he's already bought us and paid for us. Now, he explains here also that, you know, that we have a light and we ought to shine that light. And what does light do? It divides light from darkness. When you have a dark room and you turn on a flashlight, now all of a sudden you have a division. You see two different things. You see the darkness and you see the light. We have been given light. We have light within us through Jesus Christ. That is the light. There's the light of the gospel that we need to shine. We live in a dark world. We need to shine that dividing light into this world. And we can't hide it. He says, don't hide it under a bushel. You need to, to shine it as, as bright as you can, as far as you can. That's what God wants us to do with the light. He says in verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Verse number 19, again, this is one of the problems with being too ecumenical and yoking up with a whole bunch of different people who believe all kinds of different things and forsaking, you know, what we believe about obeying God's law. Because a lot of people think that we don't have to obey any of God's laws because we're free in grace. We don't, we don't care about God's law anymore. And so many people don't even care about what the New Old Testament says. They only look at the New Testament and they miss out on a lot of the, the laws and teachings from God's word that's going to help us be right with God. And it's going to keep us from being chastened from God. Verse 19 says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. Jesus is talking about obeying the commandments. Not for our salvation, but just because we need to obey the commandments because they are commandments. They're commands, not suggestions. He says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, obviously he's talking about people who are saved. And what he's saying is, if you have one person that's saved and they're breaking a, a small commandment, okay? Let's say I consider tithing to be a small commandment, okay? The, and, and you can pick whatever. Maybe you think that's a bigger commandment. It doesn't matter. Let's just use it for sake of argument, right? Let's just say tithing. I think it's a least commandment. But if someone says, you know, uh, they're breaking the least of that commandment. They said, nope, don't have to tithe. And then they're teaching everyone else, saying, nope, you don't have to tithe. You don't have to do that. He says, well, of course they're still saved because you're not saved by obeying the law. You're not, you're not saved by obeying any commandments. But that person's going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, praise God, they're still in heaven, right? But, but if you go around breaking God's commandments and teaching men, so even if it's the least of the commandments, and you decide for yourself what that means, it doesn't matter. Whatever the least of the commandments is, you break it, it says, you're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I don't want to go to heaven and just be Mr. Least. <laughs> I don't want to be least. Hey, I want to be great. I want, I want to do the most for God. I want God to view me and say, man, what are you doing? You're, you're teaching people that they don't even have to follow this commandment, but I gave this commandment. And that's why he says, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We need to make sure that we have purity in our doctrine we know God's word. We know what the Bible says so that we don't become guilty of breaking one of the least commandments. And we're, especially we're not teaching other people. You know, if you're going to teach somebody something, make sure you know for yourself. Don't take words that I say or any other teacher or pastor says and just repeat them to people and teach them just based off of my words or someone else's words. Make sure that you know for yourself what God's word says. So that you know that what you're saying is right, that, that, you know, that I'm not incorrect or that someone else isn't incorrect, that you know that this is what the Bible says. Because if you're going to teach somebody else that, you better know for yourself. You can't just blame, well, so-and-so said that this was true and I repeated what he said. Well, no, that's your responsibility. 
If you teach someone else, make sure you know what you're talking about. And there's no reason why you can't. We all have God's Word and we all have God's Holy Spirit to teach us. So um, we ought to be able to do that. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. It's a shorter sermon tonight. We're almost done. Acts chapter 17. If you're preaching the Word of God and there's not some commotion, there's not people being stirred up, there's no opposition to what you're saying, everybody loves you, everybody thinks you're great, then you're doing something wrong. Think about the examples that we have. We already read in Matthew chapter 5 when he says that, you know, when you're persecuted and people revile you, he says, hey, be happy about that. Why? He says, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So the men of God, the prophets that were before before the days of Jesus, going all the way back in the Old Testament, they were persecuted. And talk about good examples. I mean, these were men of God that were used to give us God's word. So if they were persecuted, why would we think that we would be any different if we are going to do a great work for God? Of course, we should be in the same group as them. We're not better than them. I'm not better than Moses. Look at the persecution Moses suffered. I'm not better than David. I'm not, you know, I'm not better than these great men of God. So I don't think that I'm above being persecuted. Jesus warned us that we're going to be persecuted. The Bible says, yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We're warned about it many, many times in the Bible. And I'll tell you this, if we are not being perse facing persecution at some point in our life over our faith, then we're not shining that faith bright enough. We're not living the way that God told us to live. It's going to come. It's going to happen. And like I said, if it's not, now I'm not going to say it, it doesn't happen necessarily every single day of your life. You're not just always in, you know, in consumed with persecution. But it does come. And if it's not coming at all, there's something, there's a problem. Acts chapter 17, verse number five, the Bible says, but the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. This was the response of the disciples going out and preaching God's word. So these people are turning the whole world upside down. They're causing problems. They're stirring things up. And we don't like it and we want it to stop. And they're ready to kill people over it. People, anybody throughout history who's ever actually done things for the Lord and has been very vocal in their faith and preaching the truth of God's word is, got, has gotten persecuted. Has stirred things up and gotten persecuted. Look at Jesus Christ himself. Nobody can be better than Jesus at communicating. Jesus was a master at everything. He's a master with his words. He, even when people tried to trip him up and, and, and set a trap for him with his words, he always was able to get out of it. Always. He was great at using his words. Yet, even though he was so great at using his words, he still preached the truth and people still hated him and people conspired to put him to death and that's exactly what happened. People still spit on him. They smacked him in the face. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They beat him till he was a bloody pulp. And I'll tell you what, we are not better than Jesus in any way. But the, the, the false teachers out there are going to try to tell you that we're wrong if people come and persecute us and hate us. They say, no, 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 you need to have everybody love you. No, if everybody loves you, you're doing something wrong. That's why I keep an eye out for the false prophets like the Billy Grahams and the Joel Osteens and these people where everybody loves them. They're not, you know, national TV, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, they could go anywhere, walk into any church, and they're welcome. They could cross denominations, they could go anywhere, and people just love them. You know what? That's a wolf. That's a false prophet. 
Because if you're preaching God's word, you are not going to be that well received. You'll be received by some people, no doubt. Jesus was received by some people, but overall, he came unto his own and his own received him not. He did have his disciples. He did have his followers. Small percentage over the great mass, over the great whole. By and large, he was rejected, despised, persecuted, spit upon, reviled, everything. As were all of the prophets. Unfortunately, especially with new believers and people who are new to the faith, they experience things like this happen. I, we experienced it. My wife experienced it. When we got into a church, we got into a good church. We got into a church that was doing some great works for God. We got into a church that was good on soul winning. We got into a church where the pastor and the people were not afraid to stand on God's word and would not compromise regardless of what this world says or thinks. And what happened? The persecution starts to come from family, from friends, from, oh, you go, oh, that's a cult. Oh, you know, and all these other things start coming to the point where even my wife, she was, she was a younger Christian at the time when we started to suffer this from her own family members was, was starting to be impacted by all the negative comments and all this other stuff to where she, you know, the, 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 the thought came into her mind to find a different church. But see, that was the right place for us to be because they are the ones actually doing the most work for God. And it was a trial. It's a testing. And God wants us to stay true to his word. Now, we stayed, we stayed true. And I thank God for that. But it's, it could be difficult sometimes, but we need to know that these things are going to happen. We need to know that if we're making the right stand, there will be opposition. And it may be opposition really close to home. Jesus came and, and he brought division. Now, one of the reasons I'm even preaching this sermon is because, one, it's just needed. We need, you know, we need to make stands and not be worried about just joining, yoking up with all kinds of different people. Recently, we were, we were involved in a ministry that I did want to get involved in. And I still want to get involved in other ministries because I do want to reach out and help people in different situations. And I, do like, I would like to get a platform to be able to present people with the truth from God's word. But this ministry we were in, I fully expected to get kicked out at some point. Because there's an organization that, that uses various churches of all different Christian denominations, and they bring them all in and allow them to come in and preach to the, to the people at their home. It was, it, was a, it was a mission. It was a rescue mission. And they're bringing in Mennonites. They're bringing in, you know, whatever, all different kinds of groups. And... You know, I let me start off with this. Even though I fully expected to get kicked out, that wasn't our intention. We weren't going into this place to cause trouble, to stir things up. In fact, when I first went there and I met with them because I wanted to make sure, I didn't want to just go and waste my time and get kicked out immediately. So I asked, say, hey, you know, I don't want to step on any toes. So, you know, there's certain things in that situation because it's not our church that I can steer away from certain subjects. And I was already planning on steering away on certain subjects anyways because it, it, it wasn't relevant to what they were doing and it wasn't their church. I was just going to minister and to help other people out. So I asked these things and, oh, yeah, it's fine. You know, wherever the Spirit leads you, you know, we, we let, it's pretty open. We let people teach what they want to teach and stuff. Okay, great. What do they need? You know, they need to hear the gospel. They need to hear, you know, just good truths out of the Bible. They need to be able to trust God. And, okay, great. So we go there the first day, I'm, I preach the gospel. Preach on internal security. Really important, right? Something that everybody needs to hear. Go there the next week, we preach on, on the, the, the King James Bible being the Word of God. Very basic stuff. Very simple stuff. Now look, these are things that I bring up to anybody that gets saved right away. The issues, the things I was going to preach on there were all very elementary, basic things. But apparently this issue of the King James Bible being the Word of God is very divisive among other people. And what's funny is that I was pegged as the one that was the troublemaker and stirring up problems among the people because after I preached the sermon and I showed everybody, look, 
They had every version under the sun in this place except for the King James Bible, which now they've got King James Bibles there. Hopefully they still have them because we brought them some to have in their place. They had every, all these, I mean, they had even like the weird versions there. You know, the message or whatever, like these ones where they just completely bastardized the word of God. Just, I mean, and it's just obvious. and It's not even close to scripture whatsoever. Yet I come in, I show them, and I give them all the examples and, and, and do a teaching. And you know what? Everybody was very involved. Everybody loved it. They were very interested in the subject. I didn't push anything on them. I showed them some information. It's up to them what they do with it. But then I'm the one being divisive because I want to unify people around one Bible, around the Word of God. I mean, how much more basic can you get? And, you know, they're trying to say that it's, you know, oh, these, you know, these, a lot of these are baby Christians. You have to give them the milk. How much more milk do you get than just this is the Bible? If you're going to base everything that you believe off of a book, you better have the right book. Because when you have two different books or three different books or a hundred different books that all say different things, you got to make a choice. You can't just say they're all right. Because some of them contradict each other. And, and what I showed them, and good luck now, they were, thank God I at least had that opportunity for three weeks to be able to preach to them. Because they, at least the people that were there saw that the NIV calls Jesus Christ Satan. They calls him Lucifer. When you look at Isaiah chapter 9, and it talks about, um, in, in the King James Bible, it uses the word Lucifer, being the, um, the son of the morning. The NIV says, He's the, bright, he's the morning star, that Lucifer is the morning star. And then you go to Revelation, and it's referring to Jesus as the morning star, using the same name, the same title for both Satan and Jesus. That's what the NIV does. That is not the Word of God. The Word of God does not call Jesus Lucifer, or Lucifer Jesus, or equate the two in any way, shape, or form. King James Bible is very distinct. One is Lucifer, son of the morning. The other one is Jesus Christ, the bright and morning star. Two different things. So I show them the evidence. And, I show, and they're like, wow, that's, you know, they're blown away. I was blown away by it the first time I saw it too. But is that something that's really so difficult to comprehend and that you need to have some theology degree to understand? No. People actually cling to that pretty quick. Because you know what's confusing? You know what causes people to be, to, to, to be shaked and shaken in their faith? Is when you tell them, oh, of the 400 different versions of the Bible in English, none of them are really right. Yeah, that's really going to get people to trust the Word of God. Oh, because there's translation errors. And all, oh, but you can trust it. Well, which one? Well, it doesn't really matter. You could just compare them all and just figure out what. That's confusing. You're not going to have any unity that way. And if I was going to continue to teach anything out of the Bible, I need to at least show them and say, hey, this is why I'm using this old Bible, and this is why it's not okay to just use various translations because they tell you a lie and say, well, it's easier to understand. When no, it actually has different words in it and just has different meanings in it. They don't say the same thing. But the people have been lied to. You see, when you bring in the light... You bring in the truth, you shine the light, it causes division. And it is what it is. And I'm not sad about it, and I'm never going to compromise on it. And I ended up just, just telling them, say, hey, if you ever change your, your mind or position on this, let me know, because I'd be glad to come back and, and help out. And I would. And I care about the people there, but I'm not going to withhold a basic truth like what God's word is. You know, this is not some denominational difference thing. This has nothing to do with denominations. It has to do with what the Word of God actually is. And you know what? It's going to cause division, and I'm fine with that because I'm actually trying to bring unity. Let's have unity around one Bible. Wouldn't that be great? You know, these people that want to unify with all these other churches can't even unify around what the Word of God is. Talk about confusion. And you know what? God is not the author of confusion. We know who that is. We know who the author of confusion is. So, you know, it's, it's interesting how people will say you're doing really what they're doing. 
saying, I'm causing confusion. I'm causing problems. I'm stirring things up within the home because of these teachings. Well, praise God. Because you know what? If people aren't stirred up, if you're not having these questions, if you're not having people talking about it, if you're not having any type of impact or division, are you even preaching Jesus? See, they want us to preach a Jesus that doesn't divide anybody. That's another Jesus. That's not the Jesus I know because the Jesus I know just said exactly what's true and, and didn't worry if people rejected him or not. He didn't. When, when, his, when the multitudes left Jesus, after he says, I am the bread from heaven, and he says, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood or else you have no power with my father. When he made that sermon, everybody left him. And you know what he said to his disciples? He didn't say, oh, you guys, please don't leave me. I don't want to be alone. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. That's not what he said. He said, are you guys going to go too? Go ahead. Why? Because what he said was the truth. And if people can't handle it, that's their problem. I'm not going to treat everybody like I walk around eggshells because they're newly saved or whatever. I'm going to teach the truth. And that's the way I would like to be treated also. And I'm glad I was treated that way when I was still a baby Christian, is that people weren't afraid to just say, thus saith the Lord. You don't need to hide it from me because I'm a baby Christian. No, just tell me what it is. I need to grow up. I need to learn this stuff. And everybody needs to learn this stuff. And we can't censor God's word because we think that someone else isn't ready for it. That is wicked. Because then you become the judge of God's word instead of just doing what God said and that's to preach the whole counsel of God. Acts chapter 20, verse number 26. The Bible reads, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says, I have not shunned. I have not stopped to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He didn't just go and preach some of the counsel of God or one portion of the counsel. No, he says, I preached all the counsel of God. Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 28, it's not in my notes. This is our commandment. This is what we're supposed to do at the very end of Matthew, the last three, two verses. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe some things, no, all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Jesus Christ wants us to teach the nations, everybody, all things. Yet this place, this ministry that we are part of, wanted us to only teach some things and not other things. No, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to obey Jesus when Jesus says, teach them all things. Teach all nations all things. And we need to be willing to make that stand and just understand that, you know what? When you make a stand on God's word, when you're doing things right, people will separate, people will divide. You don't even have to divide from them. Usually they'll divide from you. You don't have to be the bad guy. Usually they'll just stop talking to you. It's typically the way it goes. And the Bible says, let's not be yoked up together with unbelievers. And I'll tell you what, we, you know, I want to get involved in different ministry work. But I, and I, I still don't think that these people are unbelievers. I do believe, I believe that I talked to them before we even got involved, before I did yoke up with them at all. And, and I still do think that they're believers. I mean, I, I don't know that for sure, but I, th I think they are. We're not, I'm going to be careful in the ministries that we get involved with too, because I don't want to be yoking up with them. If you know, people believe you could lose your salvation, they're not saved. They're unbelievers. I'm not going to yoke up with those people. 
We're not going to be yoking up with the Pentecostal church. We're not going to be yoking up with any of these organizations that don't believe Jesus. Got, I don't care what they're doing. I'm not going to yoke up with them. We can do the same work. We'll just do it ourselves or we'll do it with other people who are believers and not yoking up with unbelievers. We need to be prepared, though, to make that stand. Just prepare yourself in your heart and say, I'm going to stay true to God's word. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to be afraid of people's faces like God told Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Just stand up for the truth and not be afraid and not be ashamed, especially of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for... Um, your words and for the, the truth. God, we thank you for not withholding truth from us, but that you just, you lay it all out. I pray that you please help us to be good ambassadors, to teach the truth, to, uh, to show people the truth from your word. And I pray that you would um, just be with us and guide us and teach us along. Dear Lord, I know we're not perfect. But we do make mistakes. I know that all of my beliefs are, are, are not perfect, but I pray that you please help me to identify the areas where I'm wrong on and, and show me and give me the wisdom, dear Lord, and help me to share that wisdom with other people. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.